Welcome to the online worship service of Triumph Lutheran Brethren Church. Triumph is a multi-site church in the Midwest with campuses in Moorhead, Minnesota and West Fargo, North Dakota. Our vision is to see the life and message of Jesus transform hearts, homes, and cities. We're grateful that you've joined us online as the Lord works through our ministry both locally and around the world. Wherever you are at, our prayer is that God would meet you and that the life and message of Jesus would transform your life. We are continuing on in our Advent series through chapter 13 of the Gospel of Mark. Uh, Our text for right now is uh, Mark 13, verses 28 to 31, but I'm actually going to be reading a little bit before that and a little bit after that because I think it will help us understand uh, the heart and the meaning 
of our text for today. So uh, I'm going to start reading for us at verse 24. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in heaven will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. The word of the Lord. So verse 26, Jesus tells us that there will be a day. There will be a day when he, the Son of Man, will come in clouds with great power and glory. Now, notice that he doesn't say coming through the clouds. Uh, he, he says he's coming in or, or, or with clouds. Jesus says, I'm coming and I'm coming with clouds. Now, why? I, I mean, what, what's the deal with, with the clouds, the power and glory and all that? But what does that mean? Well, think back to the book of Exodus when, when God leads the children of Israel out of their slavery in Egypt and he leads them through the wilderness. You remember what the presence of God appeared like, what it looked like? How did God reveal himself to his people back then? During the day, it looked like what? A cloud, right? And at night, it was a, a, a fiery pillar or a, a fiery glory, there's actually even a Hebrew word for this, this phenomenon. It, it was called the Shekinah, the glory cloud. It's the, the radiating brilliance of the presence of God. And wherever God is fully present, that's paradise. Why is it paradise? Well, because in God's presence, the, the Shekinah, the, uh, if, if, first of all, here's what you get with the Shekinah. You get a real tangible sense of God's love and mercy and grace and beauty and power and glory and holiness. And just as importantly, here's what you don't get with the Shekinah. In God's presence, you don't have death. There's no death or disease or brokenness. There's no evil, no suffering, no pain, no tears. Nothing's bad, no, nothing's wrong, nothing's broken, nothing's missing. These things don't exist in God's presence. And that's why it's paradise. Because the presence of God is there and all these other terrible things are not. So, Verse 26 is telling us that when Jesus Christ comes back, he's bringing the Shekinah, the, the, the glory cloud presence of God, this time to envelop the whole world and to make the whole world paradise again, just like it was in the beginning. All right, so this, this context here really helps us to see what Jesus means with his fig tree illustration in verse 28. He says there, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. <clears throat> as soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. Now, back then, there evidently weren't very many trees, plants in Israel that, that lost their leaves in the wintertime. Most of them kept their leaves year-round, but the fig tree was one of the trees that did lose its leaves in winter, and then they didn't come back till spring. So you know what Jesus is saying? He's saying, I'm coming with the glory cloud. 
and I'm bringing the, the ultimate spring with me, the, 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 the true and ultimate summer. After thousands of years of winter, I'm bringing the ultimate sunlight, and, and, and I'm going to make the world a perfect summery paradise once again. It's the end of poverty and hunger, the end of injustice, the end of disaster and disease, the end of suffering and pain, the end of sin and death. This is the restoration and the renewal of all creation. Jesus says, I'm coming and paradise is coming with me. Now C.S. Lewis picks up on this theme in his book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It's a story about four kids, Peter, Edmund, Susan, and Lucy, who, who, who stumble into the magical land of Narnia. But when they get there, they find that Narnia is under the spell of the white witch. And so it's always winter in Narnia. Even worse, it's always winter and never Christmas. But one of the creatures in Narnia, Mr. Beaver, he tells the kids that there are whispers. Whispers that the true king of Narnia, Aslan, is on the move. Whispers that Aslan is coming back to Narnia to, to put an end to the white witch and her never-ending winter for good. He tells the kids that there's an ancient prophecy about the return of Aslan. The prophecy goes like this. Wrong will be right when Aslan comes in sight. At the sound of his roar, sorrows will be no more. When he bears his teeth, winter meets its death. And when he shakes his mane, we shall have spring again. This is essentially what Jesus is saying here in Mark. When I return in clouds, winter meets its death. I'm bringing the ultimate spring. The, I, I'm going to make this world the perfect summary paradise that it was always meant to be. And then he doubles down on this. Then Jesus straight up guarantees that this is going to happen. In verse 31, Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So look, I mean, th this is so bold. This is so electric. Jesus is saying that, that my words, everything that I've said, everything that I've just told you is more enduring than creation itself. Jesus says my word is, is more solid, more dependable, more unshakable, more durable than heaven and earth itself. Jesus says heaven and earth have a better chance of disappearing into thin air than my word not coming true. When Jesus says something, it's as good as done. It's locked in. And so when Jesus tells us that after thousands of years of winter, I'm bringing the ultimate spring, I'm going to make this world the, the summary paradise that it was always meant to be, you can count on it. It's as good as done. It's locked in. Which is why Jesus then tells us, do not sleep on this. Do not sleep on this. Watch for the second coming. Watch for my return. Don't get spiritually sleepy. And so I hope that you'll take Jesus seriously when he says this, when he says, don't sleep on this. Don't say, Mm. Don't yawn about this because Jesus is coming. And here's the thing nobody knows when. Nobody has any idea when Jesus is coming again. Look at verse 32. Jesus says, But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor me, the Son of Man but only the Father. 
So, you know, the more that I thought about this, the more that I realized that the biggest question for us right now isn't trying to, to figure out what Jesus is saying. Because honestly, that seems very clear. That just seems extremely clear and straightforward. Jesus is coming. He's bringing paradise with him. It is going to happen, and we don't know when. This is not hard to understand. This is as simple as can be. So the issue isn't what Jesus said. The biggest question, the issue for us, I think, is how do we hear what Jesus said? That's the bigger question. How do you hear this? Because look, we all know that two people can hear the the, the very same thing. They can hear the very same words. And it can mean two very different things. And for some of us, when we hear Jesus saying, I'm coming back someday and nobody knows when, some of us hear this, <clears throat> some of us hear this and we go, uh oh, oh no, oh man, this, this is bad news. When I was in college in uh, Eau Claire, Wisconsin, I worked in the fishing department at a sporting goods store called Gander Mountain. And w- one of my coworkers there was a guy named Dan. And one day, you know, things were pretty slow in the store, and so a few of us are standing around talking when Dan tells us this story about the time that he was in high school that his parents went to Chicago for the weekend. So he was alone, he's an only child, and so his parents left him home in charge of the house. And his mom and dad took off Friday after school and they said that they'd be back sometime late Sunday afternoon. And right before they left, his mom said, no parties, okay? And Dan's like, yeah, 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 I know, I know, I know that. Would you guys just go already? And so Dan's mom and dad get in the car and they take off and as soon as they're gone, You'll never guess what happens. Dan calls his friends and invites them to a party at his house. Dan had it all worked out. He said that you know, he'd have the party Saturday night, sleep in Sunday morning, and then have the house whipped back into shape by lunchtime on Sunday, in plenty of time for his mom and dad to come home Sunday afternoon. So on Saturday night, you know, like half the junior class at Eau Claire North High School shows up for a party at Dan's house. And, well, it's, it's not the drinking root beer, playing Monopoly kind of party. So uh, the night goes on, and, and a few of Dan's friends realize that, that they're in no condition to go back to their homes, so they all decide that they're going to spend the night at Dan's place. So they call their parents, and they tell them that they're going to sleep at Dan's house. And then I mean, they all, they, they all say, oh, yeah, uh, Dan's mom totally said it was okay. Don't worry. Well, by 3 o'clock in the morning, the party's over. I mean, the place is a disaster. And most of the kids are gone, but the ones who are still there staying over are sleeping or passed out, including Dan. Except two of Dan's friends are still up sitting on the couch watching TV, you know, probably watching an infomercial for the pocket fisherman or a magic bullet or something. And then all of a sudden, the kids watching TV see headlights shine in the front windows. And one of them, a, a kid everybody calls Toad, he goes over to the window and he looks outside. And then he runs over to the chair where Dan's sleeping and he starts shaking him. Dan, Dan, your parents are home. And I'm not going to repeat what Dan said. But when the rest of the kids hear that Dan's parents are home, those 16-year-old boys come shooting out the back door of that house like somebody pulled a trigger. Dan's parents are home. And this was not in any way good news. And they're scared. But they aren't nearly as scared as Dan is. Because Dan has nowhere to run. When Dan heard that his parents were home, this was some serious bad news. Uh Oh, 
oh, oh, no, oh, man, this is bad news. Which is how some of us hear the news that Jesus is coming and we don't know when. But look, that's not how Jesus wants us to hear this. We might hear this as bad news, but it isn't bad news. And we don't have to hear it that way. That this doesn't have to be bad news. This doesn't need to be threatening. It doesn't need to be a warning. This is good news, wonderful news. This is the kind of news that is meant to be a, a source of comfort and joy and hope. But it all depends on how you hear it. When I was in seminary, uh, some of you know that I worked for Hillcrest Academy in Fergus Falls, which uh, is a, a private boarding high school that's affiliated with the Church of the Lutheran Brethren. So, so anyway, uh, when we were there, Amy and I were dorm parents for you know, like 35, 40 high, high school boys. And while we were there, we chaperoned Hillcrest's choir tour when they toured the East Coast during a spring break. Now, our kids stayed home, and Amy and I were gone for the, the whole break. And I'll never forget stepping off that tour bus when we got back to Fergus Falls and seeing our three kids, Jacob, Elizabeth, and Andrew, all lined up and ready and waiting for us. Because they knew that we were coming. Now, they didn't know exactly when we were going to be there, but it didn't matter because this was such good news to them that they were ready for it at any time. And when they saw us, they, they ran as fast as they could and they hugged us like they never let go. I mean, when Jacob and Elizabeth and Andrew heard that their parents were home, it wasn't a threat. It wasn't a warning. It was good news, great news, the best news. And see, that's how the Lord Jesus wants us to hear that he's coming and we don't know when. He doesn't want us to hear it as bad news like, like Dan heard that his parents were home. He wants us to hear it as good news like Jacob, Elizabeth, and Andrew heard that their parents were home. Jesus wants us to hear that he's coming back and we don't know when as good news, as wonderful news. He wants us to hear it as tidings of comfort and joy. Comfort and joy. Why? Why is this good news? How can we know for sure that this is good news? Here's how we can know. Because in the first coming of Jesus, he didn't come to bring judgment. He came to take it. He took our sin so that we could have forgiveness. He took our death so that we could have eternal life. He took our hell so that we could have heaven. He knew the Father's forsakenness so that we could know the Father's presence, the presence of God, the, the summary paradise of God forever and ever and ever and ever. Good news? No, this is the best news that we're ever going to hear. Earlier, I talked about the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe when Mr. Beaver told the kids uh, uh, that prophecy about the return of Aslan, the king. Remember, wrong will be right when Aslan comes in sight. At the sound of his roar, sorrows will be no more. When he bears his teeth, winter meets its death, and when he shakes his mane, we shall have spring again. Well, I want to close by telling you how the kids in the story heard the news about Aslan coming again. This is how it's written in the story. 
The moment Mr. Beaver had spoken these words about Aslan coming again, everyone felt quite different. Perhaps it has sometimes happened to you in a dream that someone says something which you don't understand, but in the dream it feels as if it had some enormous meaning which makes the dream so beautiful that you remember it all your life and you're always wishing you could get into that dream again. It was like that now. At the name of Aslan, the children felt something jump inside of them. Peter felt suddenly brave and adventurous. Susan felt as if some delicious smell or some delightful strain of music had just floated by her. And Lucy got the feeling, the feeling you have when you wake up in the morning and realize that it is the beginning of the holidays, or the beginning of summer. Jesus is coming again, and we don't know when. And when Jesus comes, he's coming with the glory cloud, and he's bringing ultimate spring with him, the ultimate true summer. After thousands of years of winter, Jesus is bringing ultimate sunlight. And he's going to make this world a perfect summery paradise once again. Which means it's the end of poverty and hunger and injustice. It's the end of disaster and disease. It's the end of suffering and pain. It's the end of sin and death and hell. This is the restoration and renewal of all creation. Jesus is coming and paradise is coming with him. And this is the very best kind of good news. The kind of powerful good news that keeps you wide awake and ready for Jesus to come at any moment. And who knows? Who knows? That day might be sooner than anyone thinks. Because after all, just just like Mr. Beaver said, they say Aslan is on the move. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're waiting for your son, Jesus, to come again. Help us to look forward to this. Help us to receive this good news and look forward to his return with comfort and hope and joy and peace. Strengthen us so that we'll stay eager and awake, so that we'll faithfully keep watch, so that we'll stay connected with you through your word, through prayer, through your church. And help us to not grow weary. Help us to never lose the comfort and joy and excitement that Jesus is coming again. And may that lead all of us to live lives of repentance and faith and trust according to your mercy and grace. Sustain us to the end, Father. For we do ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I'm Pastor Doug, and I want to take a minute and and say thank you for watching the worship service today. If you'd like to extend your time of worship, we have a couple links to worship songs that fit today's message in the description down below. Simply click and you can spend more time with Jesus in your day today. I have three quick thoughts that I wanted to share with you, and it'll only take a minute. First, we'd love to connect with you. If you'd be willing, you can visit our website at triumphlbc.org connect and let us know how we can reach you. 
or you can visit triumphlvc.org slash events to find an activity that you could jump into. Second, we hope that you see this content as a supplement to your walk with Jesus. Our digital content really isn't designed to replace belonging and engaging with a gospel community. So whether that's here at Triumph or at another church, we invite you to find a community that you can connect with. And third, we invest a lot of resources into producing content that's used to bless people just like you all over our community. If this or any of the other resources we have here at Triumph have blessed you, would, would you consider giving? It's because of your generosity that we are able to continue creating and serving online.